So my name is Cliff, uh, and this is my talk. Uh, I'd like to start by asking a question. Uh, does anyone know where this is? <laughs> Except for those of you who are from, no. Just. South Africa? Yes, this is Cape Town, South Africa. This is, I, I say my home. Uh, it's where I would live if I was not uh, in, well, I won't tell you where I am because that's the next slide. <laughs> I ended up uh, basically getting a request, Do, would you like to come live in the cold and darkness uh, on the other side of the planet? Uh, does anyone know where this is? Sweden. Yeah. Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so one of my claims to fame or something like this uh, is that I spent four and a half years working uh, at a company called Spotify. Uh, some of you might possibly have heard of them, a uh, small music company based out of Sweden. Uh, a lot of people are actually quite surprised that they're based in Stockholm. Um, but yeah, a lot of my stories that you will hear today come from that experience, but also from my South African experience, uh, mostly from a product management background, a little bit of agile coaching, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, but yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Before I start with my talk, I want to kind of set it up with a little bit of a story. Uh, so my story is this. A young kid, uh, for those of you who have kids, you know that uh, kids are quite curious. Uh, and so a young kid is watching their parents cooking some dinner. Uh, and basically what happens is the kid looks at their parents as they put uh, this chicken into the oven, notices that the parents cut a little bit off the top of the chicken before it goes in the pan. Kid, of course, says, what's their favorite question? Why? Why, Why do you do this? What's the reason, right? Parents look at each other, they have no idea. We learned this from our parents. So short hop, skip and jump. They ask the parents, they ask the grandparents. The grandparents pack out laughing at this question and say, well, my dears, the reason we removed a little piece off the top of the chicken was when we got married, we did not have so much money. Uh, our oven was really small. The only way to fit the chicken in the pan, remove a piece off the top. So here we are two generations later, uh, and this practice has been passed on, copied and pasted, if you will, uh, through the generations. No one except for that child had thought to ask why. So why do I tell you the story? Well, I think very often in our organizations, we do these kind of things, right? Uh, we borrow something. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of this thing called the Spotify model. Uh, OKRs, objectives, all kinds of things like this. Why do we borrow this? Well, Spotify is doing it. They must be successful because of it. Uh, so let's borrow that thing. So what I want to do is kind of tell you a little bit of a story that I think tries to counter, uh, well, maybe tell you why it is that I think we do this, uh, and some of the things that we could do instead if we want to go beyond this idea of just copying and pasting uh, what everyone else is doing. So, part of it is that I think we're talking a little bit about perception. Uh, and what I mean in this sense is that for those of you who've gone through maybe a recruitment process at a company, uh, you have been in a situation uh, where they tell you a story about the company during your hiring process, right? And of course, their oven is the shiniest in the world, uh, and you can only get it here, and everything is magic. Uh, and of course, when you arrive, things might be a little bit different, right? Uh, it could be something like this, right? <laughs> it's not bad. It's just a different way of cooking, right? But the things that you could cook with this perhaps differ from what you would do in the flashy, fancy, silver bling oven uh, from the previous picture. And perhaps after you've been around a couple of months, you start to realize maybe not so much like this. <laughs> More like this, yeah. And occasionally, every once in a while, <laughs> more like this, yeah. So the question, of course, well, as I said, why is perception important? Uh, a big part of why it's important for me is not to try to say that one oven is better than the other. But if you have a different one of these, certain things, become more possible to cook, right? If you've ever tried to cook a pizza in a microwave oven, great for warming it up, perhaps. Uh, but the idea here basically is certain things become possible and enabled by your environment. So it's really important that you understand what your organization is capable of. Uh, Helen was talking about this uh, yesterday, actually, in this very room, uh, and mentioned this idea that if you don't know where you are, how do you find out your journey, where do you go from there, right? I want to get somewhere, but I don't know where I am. I might book a flight when I should be booking a bus or taking a short walk, yeah? 
So with this in mind, I want you to keep it in mind that what I'm saying to you is not about copying and pasting. It's actually trying to encourage you to go beyond this. Uh, I will say with a bit of a disclaimer, I think it's okay to take inspiration from other people. Some, someone else is doing something interesting and cool. But ask first that question that this kid is asking when the chicken is being prepared. Why are they doing it? Do we have that same thing? Or is it actually that we just have a really, really small oven? Yeah? So let's have a look at this through three lenses. Uh, first up, we're going to talk about systems, how everything fits together, and why this is so important. We're going to talk about science a little bit. It's a very shallow dive into science, but just the idea that we need to understand and validate what we're doing, how does it work, and what are the outcomes of this. And finally, sapiens, because I like a nice rhyme. Uh, human beings, the wonderful diversity of all of us and our unique needs and capabilities. So let's jump in with number one. And as you can tell, this is about the point I discovered uh, animations in Keynote. Uh, there are a few more, but not too many. Uh, so I talk about this as the interactions between the flight levels, right? I will explain the concept of flight levels a little bit later on, but essentially, often what I see with organizations is your reality is something a little bit like this. You've got scrum boards and Kanban boards all over the place, but as the person in the middle, you're being pulled from one thing to the next, right? It's not really clear what's important, although everything is somehow perhaps on fire. So why does this happen? I think we've all seen something like this. Perhaps if you've lived in Johannesburg, for sure, uh, you have experienced this traffic. Uh, if you've ever tried to drive around in London uh, when there is a caravan on the highway, uh, perhaps you've experienced something a little bit like this. Uh, but basically, the challenge, as I think some of us know, is that what we're essentially doing as individuals and as leaders in our organization is that we're looking at this picture and going, I know what we need. We could be more efficient. I see a gap. I see a gap, I see a gap. <laughs> we should start some more stuff, right? Of course, does that make the situation better or worse? Of course it makes it worse. So let's have a look at a way that we can start to address some of this. So some of you may have seen uh, the talk by Klaus Leopold where he talks about a number of these things. Uh, Klaus is uh, the, the other co-founder or one of the other co-founders of the Flight Levels Academy. I borrow a few of his slides. We do a lot of work together. So the idea here, typical team board, essentially what you're seeing is that if we ask this question of when that thing arrives in done, is it done for the customer? And well, the answer is usually there's something like this that happens uh, between what we call done. We're not necessarily visualizing this. Yeah? This is obviously a software development perspective, but you have something like this in almost every type of work that you do. Of course, if we keep asking the question, the famous five whys, maybe we could ask many more. Uh, usually what you find is there's a few extra things. Uh, and of course, we're not doing these in a very agile manner. They tend to happen once a month, once a quarter, something like this. The good news, however, is once we've survived all of this red uh, jumping through hoops, uh, usually we arrive at something like done. But of course, we discover that actually on the other side of this, this is only the development backlog, right? There is something that has to happen before this happens or before we get even to our step of the process. We ask a few more whys. We go a little bit towards the left. What happens over here? Maybe a product backlog, some analysis. If we go even further, perhaps some steering committees, some review, triage, bunch of things, whatever in your company. And once you get to this, you zoom out, uh, as we said, not very agile in our approach, but this is where the agile is focused uh, and everybody's favorite slide. We are so fucking agile, but at the end of the day, that is the only place that we're doing it, right? You see this, we're working only in a very small number of the steps, and most of what our work is, is trying to speed up the speed at which we type rather than the speed at which things move. So, what do we do about this? Well, basically what you see here is what I, I propose as a solution, is to visualize your end-to-end -end flow. When you can see this, you can start to have a conversation about what can we do to reduce the amount of time that things spend in the red spaces and try to move those black or working dots a little bit closer to each other, right? So if you're finding yourself in an overloaded work situation, 
try to do this. Start with visualizing your end to flow, end to end flows, all the way from more rhymes, vision to value, or concept to cash, something like this. There is a second part to this challenge, uh, and some of you may know this story as well. When we design our companies, uh, we tend to create teams around specific things. This is a natural response to not having everybody in one room or in one space. It just becomes too complicated. Customer comes to us, says our wish is that you write us a love letter. What we've done, we've reduced uh, or created teams around a row on the keyboard. As the organization grows, we specialize even further. We end up with teams around every single letter on the key, or on the keyboard at least. The challenge, however, is that pressing the A key as fast as possible, which is usually the focus of most agile transformations or agile methods, yeah, Scrum is trying to optimize for that team being effective. It's not looking at the right team pushing the right key at the right time. Yeah? We need to create some interaction between the teams in order th for them to be able to work effectively. This is how we create the outcomes. So what we're really talking about here is feedback loops. Uh, and what I want you to encourage, or I sort of like this way of phrasing it, is that you need to have a healthy dose of this every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? But specifically between the teams. So often I see people having stand-ups and conversations, you know, the four of us are in a stand-up session every morning, but our work has nothing to do with each other. We don't touch each other's work in any way, shape, or form. And that, to me, seems also like waste. So it's not talking about just more information, but the right information. If you think about it like this, that shape is the same, but you have a different perspective depending on where you stand, right? There is the operations perspective, the strategy perspective, and of course, a coordination perspective on the company. And this for me comes nicely to when we look at things through a flight levels lens, what you start to see is an organization through three different lenses. Often people interpret this as layers of hierarchy, but the idea here is that this is actually levels of abstraction, right? There is something like a task level detail, stories, epics, tasks, something like this, right? Could be hiring people, building marketing campaigns, creating software, whatever it is, something that happens in the operational level. We need to work together within this space to produce a letter for our customer, and we handle that coordination here. Handoffs, dependencies, prioritization between teams, right? I need something, you need something else, or we're both working on different priorities, and we need to make a decision, which one should we do for the global good? We start to have that conversation here at level two. Of course, what we also want to do is keep an idea or keep some idea in our mind of what does the strategy look like, right? Uh, Helen was talking yesterday as well about starting with the goal in mind. What is the thing that you're actually trying to achieve, right? And we need to keep some sight of this, but we need to also be able to understand how what we do rolls up to that effectiveness. I'm not going to bore you with too much detail about flight levels uh, in all of its detail. Uh, there's a lot more information available on the internet. I'll share some links and, and so on with you in a few minutes. Um, but essentially what I want to put to you is that the idea here is that if you want to be truly agile in your organization, you have to go beyond the team level. The problems that you have in many cases of overloaded whip, chaos, and all sorts of things that are happening, these things are not solved inside a team. They are solved in the leadership and management space. They are solved with better strategy. They are solved with more coherent strategy. I think this offers some tools that can help you to address these challenges. So I need to pick up the pace slightly because I have two more points, and this is only number one. In summary, visualize your end-to-end -end flows all the way, concept to cash, vision to value, and connect strategy to operations. Go beyond the team level. This wraps up the segment on systems. But before I move on to the next one, I want to just say if you'd like to read more about these topics uh, and go a bit deeper, three fantastic books that I can recommend. Uh, some of you probably know Klaus's book in the middle. Uh, if you work with systems thinking, Donella Meadows, read everything she's written, especially the newer things. Uh, and of particular interest, if you've already read this book, is the blog post that is linked here at the bottom. I will make the slides available as well, so don't worry if you don't, uh, if it's a bit blurry in your photo or something. 
polarity management, uh, my favorite new concept of the last few years. Uh, if that sounds interesting, have a look at it. It's very easy read. It's half an hour to an hour's worth of reading, but very, very fascinating. Uh, the subtext there says, identifying and managing unsolvable problems. Uh, and most of what we deal with is actually about balance, not about a A to B problem solving. Cool. So these are my suggestions. Let's have a look at science. So in the science space, what we're talking about is observation and experimentation. right? And I talked at the beginning about the value of actually understanding why you're doing something before you start, but also in being able to tell, does it work as you go? What we're talking about, if we go back to this picture of the board, that's ominous. <laughs> we go back to this picture of the board, we're talking essentially about what happens here. When something lands in done, are we talking about an output or an outcome? Right? <coughs> Very often what we've done in these situations is that we've arrived at some kind of a conclusion uh, by doing something like this. Right? When we plan, we tend to extrapolate from fairly dubious data. Uh, and the issue with this is that, of course, getting married tomorrow doesn't mean that you're going to have infinite partners in the future, right? It's just, that's not the outcome. But we look at small cases of evidence and we assume that great things will happen. And very often, they happen a little bit differently to what we thought. Very often, this for me, for those of you who know the underpants gnomes from South Park, uh, we forget about this middle step, right? We are doing loads and loads and loads and loads of things over here, but we are not able to actually connect that to the strategy or the outcomes that we're trying to see. Part of the reason for this, uh, as Jonathan Haidt explains in this book, is that we think of ourselves as rational beings, right? We look at data, we analyze it, and then we make a decision. But that's just not how we actually work in reality. We tend to make a decision and then use our rational ability to justify the decision we've made. So we're mostly making decisions intuitively or instinctively. The other part of this is that we tend to attribute success or the, the quality of an outcome based on the result that we achieve, right? So you get lucky, you win a hand at poker, you assume you're very good at poker. Not a very safe assumption for the most part. Annie Duke talks about this at length in this wonderful book. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite books. Uh, on decision making. Uh, she's got a new book apparently that's just come out. I haven't read it yet, but uh, highly recommend this one. So how do you avoid this? Well, I think the most simple thing to do is to start with a very basic write down your hypothesis, right? I don't mean make a massively long, complicated business case for every decision you have to make. We're not trying to prove everything in advance, right? We're just trying to say, I think if I do A, B, and C, some outcome will happen. Then give it a try, look at what actually happened, and compare those two. Because the difference between the result and what you expected is your opportunity to learn. Yeah? One way to think about this, if you're trying to write down your hypothesis, what would the benefit be if we had this thing today? What would the outcome be? Be amazed how often we forget to understand that there is an outcome. We're very focused on, I'm going to do this thing, dot, 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 magic and ponies out the other side. Yeah? Go through this. It will help you to make sure that your action is more coherent uh, with the surrounding information that you have. Another piece of this is to consider what assumptions would have to be true in order for this to work. Right? People would have to agree with me. It would have to be delivered by a certain date. I would have to be right about my hypothesis, several things along these lines. So quantify your hypothesis before you start and reflect as you go. Don't just look at it at the end. You're part way in. Is it going in a good direction? Does this smell good? Does it make sense? We can, of course, also ask the question of what happened after we delivered. If you're in the habit of doing this, uh, as I described earlier, but there's still space and cramming things in. Uh, I have one suggestion specifically for you, which is this idea of don't let number three block number one. Quite simply, what I see us doing so often uh, is we create traffic jams in the organization by giving every single team, every single department its own to-do list. All we're trying to do is say, bring it together into a level two system and have that conversation in one place. 
so that we don't have 16 different lists, we have one. If you don't do this, what happens as a result is that the organization is going to make those decisions for you. And it's not about whether or not they're going to make the right decision, but they will definitely make a different decision. So I will decide one thing, Helen decides something completely different, and for each of you, you decide something completely different as well. Now our top priority is quite random. Yeah? We used to use this at Spotify quite a lot, and I like this idea. It helps us to avoid making traffic jams. This is what it looks like on a board. Up here in the top right, current bets. These are the company's top priorities for the organization, mirrored and visualized, but most importantly, in sequential order. So what that means, if I'm working on number one and you're working on number three, I need your help, you should switch. The other way around, not so much. And better yet, if I know this information, I can avoid interrupting people who are working on number one with annoying emails, Slack chats, and coffee visits, because I already know that they are on the most important thing. Keep it to a minimum. So, two points on science. Write your hypothesis, reflect on it, use this to learn, and don't let number three block number one. Avoid making more traffic jams. Three books. Uh, I talked about the last two already. The one that I've added here, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry. Uh, if you're having challenges around product strategy and product management and building frameworks for decision making, this book is fantastic. Uh, she does a lot of really interesting things, and this book is a great place to start. So, we have some time. Eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Cool. So, the final point is around sapiens, or the final lens at least, the wonderful diversity of human beings. How many of you have heard that saying? Have you heard this? The world's top and it. Yeah. Table this jazz table. No idea what that's. Mm. Or maybe you've heard the slightly worse version of it. Yeah. I think the challenge with this kind of thinking is that it makes the assumption that the people are at fault, and that essentially what you have inside your company is dead wood. And I want to put to you that if there is dead wood in your company. There's only two ways that it got there. You hired live wood and killed it, <laughs> or you hired the dead wood. Those are the two options. Yeah? Both of those on you. Yeah? I think we very often do this, and part of the challenge is that we make these assumptions because most of our models for thinking about the world are like this. We think about the world through the lens of machines, interchangeable parts, this kind of thing. A better metaphor is to think of ecosystems or a forest, right? There's no amount of motivational posters and uh, things on the wall, KPIs and quarterly targets that's going to make this forest grow, right? It doesn't work in that situation. Why would it work with human beings? How do we make a forest grow? Plant at the right time. Not too early, not too late. Water, just enough, but not too much. Yeah? Right angle on the sun, part of the slope, not too high on the mountain. Yeah? Take care of the bugs, sort out disease, this kind of thing. It's a systemic approach. It's very, very, very different. Who can tell me what's going on here? Nothing. <laughs> I do wish that was true. <laughs> they are discussing about. women rights. I don't know about it. What's that? Sorry, at the back? They are discussing women rights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Diversity and inclusion. This is Donald Trump's Council on Women's Rights. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can quite safely say that there is no way that this group is going to make a good decision on that topic. I think we've seen a fair amount of that evidence and of late. Why wouldn't they make a good decision? <laughs> yeah. How about this one? Somebody know what's going on here? Launching space something. Launching something? Uh, 
Yes. So I'll be honest, the first time I saw this picture, my mind doesn't go scientists, right? I look at this, maybe it's a wedding, family reunion, something like this. They've just successfully launched a Mars lander. These are the scientists behind the program. This is the Indian Space Agency. Yeah. They did it for less money than Hollywood made the movie The Martian. <laughs> Less money than anyone has put a, anything on Mars. By, I think it was 10% of the money that anyone else has spent before or since, and they did it on the first attempt. Yeah? The point is around this is that we have biases, not only in selection, but also in how we take in information, who we think can do and will do certain things. I want to tell you there's not all bad news. A little bit of the story of why does this happen? Well. Millions of years ago, we were growing up on the plains of probably somewhere nearby where I was born. Uh, one of these jumps out the bush, comes running towards you. If you sit and look at that and go, hmm, it looks yellow. It's coming quite fast, more or less in my direction. It looks a little bit hungry. That's too long a thought process. You're already lunch. <laughs> yeah? What we had to do was make a quick decision. Better to be false and run away from a fake lion, or not a lion, than to wait and find out. The problem here is that, as Daniel Kahneman calls it, we are doing a fast fit pattern match and not a best fit pattern match. We do this all the time. It saves us cognitive energy, but it also makes us assume that these people are not scientists and that this group can make a good decision about women's rights. So what we need to do instead is intentionally design around our biases. I showed you this, this picture earlier. One of the ways that we can start to do that in the organization is combining these three perspectives together. Neither one is more right than the other. They are different lenses on the same organization. Together, we see more of the picture and can make a more coherent decision. Quite simply, if you are in this situation, it says, when you are all, Men, managers, scientists, software engineers, invite some who are not. Mix it up. Just create a little bit of diversity and representation. What we want to try to do is create a situation where you no longer feel a little bit like this kid. It's not enough simply to have people present in the conversation. But if meeting a leader feels like this kid on the right, you're going to have some challenges. The same if it's when we're making suggestions, running a retrospective, or perhaps, as you've experienced, a restructure, and I suspect most definitely, a performance review. So if we want to try to blend all of these perspectives together, I think what's necessary is not only to have diversity, but we also need to create a space where people can feel that they bring their full self to that conversation, or as much of their self as is useful. If diversity is being invited to the party, the flip side of that is inclusion, which is choosing the music. Yeah? I have a couple of other examples that I wanted to show you, but I think we're running a little bit tight on time, uh, so I'm going to skip one of them and show you this one. Very often in the organization, we have a strong bias towards written or verbal. We do one exclusively and not so much the other. We need to mix it up. Try doing some of these things, right? Have some pre-reading, give people a chance to think, and most importantly, don't forget to follow up afterwards, right? You will miss so much if you require people simply to be able to have a question in the minute and not giving them the time to think. The best ideas do not usually happen immediately after I stop talking. If you're interested to look into this a bit further, three books I can recommend. Esther Derby, Always Wonderful, uh, Multipliers. Uh, this book taught me so much about leadership styles and how certain things that are my strengths can be problematic in other situations. I will almost guarantee that if you read the book, you will find something similar for yourself, but you will also find value in some things that you might think are weaknesses because you've been given shitty feedback. They are strong in the right context. And last but by no means least, Edgar Schein and Humble Inquiry. 
definitely worth learning if you, or reading if you would like to learn how to ask be better questions. So to bring this to a close, we've talked a little bit about this idea of how do we move beyond copy-paste agile. We've covered three different lenses. We've looked at systems, right? the interactions and feedback loops across all flight levels, end-to-end -end across these different systems. We've looked at science, right? the shift from output towards outcome. Uh, so that we can use it to reflect and learn and understand as we're going. And finally, sapiens, where we talked about designing around our biases to get the benefit of diverse perspectives. So this for me is how we build the missing links between strategy and operational agility. It's 30 minutes. It's not everything you need to know or everything that I know on this topic. Uh, it's for sure also the case that I don't know everything on this topic. But if you are tired of working in this kind of a situation and you would like to find out some of the ways that we have found that have been helpful, uh, I can offer you this uh, and two other quick things. There is a discount code here. This is the introduction to flight levels as a concept. Uh, it's normally 100 euros. It's got a discount code until the 31st of May for everyone who's here. Uh, jump on, have a look. If you have any issues, feel free to reach out. Um, secondly, I can offer you uh, something that is actually entirely free of charge. Uh, we host a meetup on uh, Flight Club. Uh, it's a YouTube live stream. Uh, we've been a little bit quiet the last few weeks, but it's uh, coming back quite soon. Uh, all of the past episodes are recorded. You can find us on Meetup if you want to join live, or on YouTube if you want to watch the recordings. <coughs> last thing uh, I can say to you is just as a sort of a counter argument, if you will, because very often what I hear is people saying essentially this coaching, teaching, Investing in our people, all of this, it sounds like a lot of work, it's very expensive, it takes time and energy. Essentially what this is, is this is a statement that says, well, what if we train them and they leave? In closing, I'd like to leave you with, what if you don't and they stay? <laughs> Thank you.